years as you have done. And the woman then does the same thing. It wasn't me, it wasn't me. The serpent tempted You know, he's tossing it off on someone else. That's what kids do in the playground. The serpent, the serpent tempted me, I ain't. Then the Lord go away. Okay, so the story's over, right? That's it. That's the end of the story. That's it. Now we're going to have morals from here on in. We're going to have a conclusion. So this guy, he just sketches as much as he needs, no more. Doesn't repeat himself or herself. And then he draws his conclusion. But we, you know, we, he's done this in a very few lines. And yet some of those lines, I don't know if you were familiar with them, are some of those famous lines in the literature of mankind. How many have heard or remembered those lines, even though you may be not have read the story? These are famous lines. And, you know, it's all packed into like a couple of paragraphs. This guy goes, gets the, man, the minimum he needs, and then hits you with the moral, which is usually maybe some ditty or poem that was floating around. First, Yahweh God said to the serpent, because you have done this, be accursed beyond all cattle, wild beasts. Crawl on your belly and eat dust every day of your life. Well, that's from a human point of view. I mean, the serpent doesn't know he's crawling on the, in the dirt. He doesn't mind the dirt. He's got a skin that's really good. And in fact, the dirt doesn't even cling to his skin. He can slither through the dirt, hide the dirt. He's fine. It's only human beings that don't like lying around in the dirt. Plus, half the serpents I know uh, from this area are up in the trees. So again, this is an artistic human thing, but it has no reality in terms of uh, the creature we're talking about. It's always subjective from a human point of view. But it's observant. Okay, you crawl on the dirt. That's why you crawl on the dirt, because you tend to eat. Second, I will make you enemies of each other, you and the woman. Your offspring and her offspring. She or it will crush your head, or he, that is, because what he sees you is going to stamp on you, he's afraid of you, and you will strike its heel out in the fields. This is the thing, a rattlesnake or something like that, when you're out in the you know, cobra or whatever. When you're out there, it's going to, he's going to kill you, and you're going to, the minute he sees you, he's going to kill you, and you're going to uh, bite him on the heel because that's where he's exposed. Okay, that's the snake's got his curse. The woman, okay, woman, now you're going to get it. I will multiply your pains in childbearing. You will give birth to your children in pain. Your yearning shall be for your husband, and he shall be lord over you. Well, that doesn't really flow very well in the present period. It was probably pretty effective up till about 1950. But things have gotten either out of hand or changed a lot since then. And I'm not sure, sure who's lord over anyone at the moment. It might even be vice versa. But classically, that's the way people saw things. And in the Middle East, it's pretty much still like that. The woman steps out of line. You know what happens to her. She really deep, deep, deep trouble situation. And uh, you know, it's not our world out here in California or in the States or in Europe or whatever, and that's the problem with the West versus these other er uh, cultural areas. Your yearning shall be for your husband, and he will be lord over you. And the writers notice that women have child and pain. Animals don't, to that extent, somewhat, but mankind does, because of the way mankind is constructed I think it has to do with the aperture and the hip situation. Uh, not a great physiologist, as you know. Okay, now, man, your turn. Because you listened to your wife, and you ate the tree which was forbidden you to eat. And he can say he didn't know it, but the story looks like he did know that it was from that tree. You're going to have to work for a living. And he knows that, in fact, people don't like working for a living, and it's tough, and uh, mankind does work for a living. A curse be the soil before you. With suffering, you'll get your food out of it. This is a farmer world. This is uh, not undergather anymore. This is a farming society writing this, cultivating society. 
it will yield C. And this is not the flock person writing this. This is a settled person, isn't it? Because a hunter-gatherer, he, he, he's not so worried about the soil. An Eskimo, for instance, he's out there hunting walrus and stuff. And uh, other Greek people, uh, cavemen who hunted the uh, big herds of mammoth and other creatures that were roaming around Europe and America. And it will yield, because the Middle East was settled very early and became acidified very early. And it will yield brambles and thistles and usually wild plants. With sweat on your brow, you shall eat your bread until you return to the soil because you were taken from it, or dust you are, and dust you will kill it. Return. And of course, this is one of the, again, one of the most famous lines people pronounce at funerals all the time. And uh, look right out of the office. That's how the man continues his naming activity. He named his uh, wife Eve. What does Eve mean in Hebrew? In Hebrew, the word is Hava. Hava. Hava, which is life, life. She is the source of life. She's not only the source of life, she's named life in Hebrew in this name. Because she was the mother of all those who lived. See, all these names are based on some saying that relates to that individual. We'll see that always is the case. So these guys, uh, they're always doing everything. He's a clothes maker, he's a sculptor, he's running around getting clothes from them, from skin. Well, I don't understand this, because suddenly the tree of life comes back into the picture, and God is upset about the situation because he's worried that uh, the man is going to become like us, I guess because he's, uh, he has the knowledge of good and evil that we're supposed to have, meaning uh, we the gods. So the gods are plural here, and of course Elohim, the name, uh, the second part, is a plural uh, in Hebrew anyway. Yahweh is a singular. Anyway, it probably means the royal we, or the whole host of heaven, or the other gods, or the angels, or whatever you want to think it means. See, next he's going to eat from the tree of life. But I thought he was always eating from the tree of life. So this thing is really not very consistent. But no, who cares? Nobody cares. The story is gripping. So that's all it that matters.